Make sure everything's on. Turn to Revelation chapter number 6. Revelation chapter number 6 tonight. We've been preaching through the book of Revelation. Uh, finally, we got to chapter number 6, the beginning of the tribulation period. Now, what you have in your hand tonight, everybody got a paper. All right, That's basically what I'm going to be preaching off of. What I'm trying to do through Revelation is give you something to take home and keep. And it'll help you when you study the Revelation to understand the Revelation. Now, threefold setting of Revelation, chapter 1, the things that were, chapter 2 and 3, church age, that's where we live. Chapter number 4, 5, and 6 actually are simultaneous chapters. Chapter number 4, verse number 1, you find the rapture of the church, we're in heaven. Chapter 6, verse number 1, and that's where we're going back to tonight. I want to read the first two verses. Let me get over there to it. Amen. Revelation chapter number 6. First word in Revelation chapter 6, the word and. That ties it, same time frame. All right, rapture the church and. Right that moment, you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. You find out that immediately when the church is gone, the Spirit of God is taken out of the way. He's not taken back to heaven because people can't get saved without His influence. But He no longer holds back what's going on. Boy, you look at the wickedness across our nation and across the world tonight. Uh, Satan is doing, boy, he's doing his thing. I'm going to tell you that much. He is active, he is working and he is very efficient. The Bible calls him the God of this world, and he's doing a tremendous job. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. As we read chapter number 1, chapter number 2, and, and, and uh, verse number 1 and 2 of chapter 6, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now, the, the, the book of seven seals been put in his hand. And it is the tribulation period. It's the seals of the judgment of God. Now as he opens that first seal, I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold. Now that word behold is a very strong word. It doesn't mean just to come and look at something. It means to behold it with amazement. To look at this thing. Behold, I saw a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. We have the introduction of Antichrist. Now this last week, I, hey, I just uh, dealt with three things. I'm going to preemptively open this up. Before he could come, there had to be a threefold thing done. One, a conditioning of the church. Conditioning of the pulpit. The pulpits over the last especially few deca decades have gotten to the point they no longer preach the Word of God. They preach parts of the Word of God. Some of them have drifted away from the doctrine. That's the apostasy or the falling away that you find in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The apostasy, again, the word apostasy is the Greek underlying word for falling away. It just simply means this, I once stood right here. This is where our forefathers stood. But now we no longer believe that. We stand over here. In order to fall away, you've got to have something to fall away from. So what they're doing, they're falling away from the Scripture itself, the Word of God. Everything we know is based on the Word of God. And what's happening is they'll have the Word of God, they'll carry the Word of God, and yet they no longer believe what their forefathers did about the Word of God. Uh, we're getting ready, they're getting ready to elect a new Supreme Court judge. And she is a textual judge. What that simply means is, is she will interpret the Constitution of the United uh, States in the manner that it was written. She's going to interpret it as it's written. What people do today is they tell you that the Constitution says this, but what they meant was this. And they move away from it. That falling away has been a falling away from the paths of our forefathers. Things that they, they have believed for hundreds of years. And now today, you check the pulpits across the so-called Bible Belt, let me tell you, there's very few Bible preaching, teaching churches. Now, they're churches. 
that I'm talking about that adhere to the Word of God. We are Biblicists before we're Baptists. It doesn't matter what the Baptists say unless they agree with what God says. When they agree with what God says, then we become Biblicists. This is the final authority here, the Word of God. Not what this pastor says or not what some denomination says, but what the Bible says. So one of the conditionings that had to take place was the pulpit had to be changed. Pulpits have been changed. The second thing, there had to be a conditioning of the pews. There are things going on in the pews today in churches that they once disciplined people for. They no longer do that. One thing you don't hear a lot about anymore is church discipline. I still believe in church discipline. If somebody's living in open, unrepentant sin, they're, go- and they're not going to sit on the pews of the church because the Bible commands us to, one, try to restore them. That's what discipline's about. We go to them, try to restore them to Christ. If they will not come to Christ or be restored to Christ, and they say we're going to continue in that sin, at that point in time we bring them before the church, and then we what we call church them. We, we perform church discipline. You look at churches today. Everything in the world sits on the pews and they sit comfortable. So the pulpits had to be conditioned and the pews had to be de- conditioned. Third thing, the people in general had to be conditioned. We live in a nation that's going socialist at about a thousand miles an hour. I mean, these young, these young people coming up don't believe what us older people believed. Uh, I've, I've often said they'll never know the America that we grew up in. But where little girls and little boys safe out on the streets and where women were respected, uh, even on, uh, in news and uh, people in influential places, they curse in front of women and children. When I was a boy, you didn't say a curse word in front of women and children. You didn't do that. Now they just throw words out there. They don't care who's listening or anything else. A conditioning, a general conditioning of the people, and that's worldwide. Now what I want to do is deal again with the Antichrist. Last week I dealt with the spirit of Antichrist. It's been here a long time. People now deny that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. They deny His sinless perfection of, of who He was. They, they deny His vicarious death on the cross of Calvary. They deny His bodily resurrection according to the Scripture. So what they have done is they have literally rejected Christ. Second Corinthians chapter number 11 verse number 4 talks about another Jesus whom we've not preached unto you. So what they had to do was create a Jesus that wasn't the Jesus of this Bible. They have paved the way for Antichrist. I believe he could come today, so we're going to stay now right with. The first seal is the introduction of the person of sin, Antichrist. Three things in here, or several things. One, he's going to be a pretender. The Bible said he comes on a white horse. He's a pretender. You know, when we used to watch the old westerns, the good guys always wore the white hats, all right? Rode the white horses. The bad guys had the black hat and rode the black horse. And, you know, boy, I look, I think back to the days of Hopalong Cassidy, you know, with his great big 10 gallon white hat and riding white horses and everything. We always look at that as somebody who is a good guy. You need to understand that what this world's coming to, this is not good. Antichrist is going to be one of the greatest pretenders if not the greatest pretender to ever live. Second thing, he's going to claim to be a man of peace. He said when he comes, he he that sat on that horse, he's going to have a bow, but no arrows in the bow. The Bible says he goes out conquering and and to conquer and to be conquering. All right, what he's going to do is he's going to proclaim peace. You know what this world's looking for today? They're looking for peace. The Bible said in the last days they'll cry peace, peace, but there will be no peace. And we live in days when people don't have peace in their heart. Listen, there are people across our land tonight are scared to death. They're afraid of the virus. I, I had somebody ask me the other day, preacher, don't you wear a mask? I said, yes, I don't have any underlying, as far as I know, problems. I am as healthy as a horse. 
I'm not afraid of anything walking or riding a horse. I don't wear a mask unless I'm required. I went to see Brother Carroll the other day, had put on a mask and a face shield. By the way, I got to see him Monday. Got to sit down across at the end of the table away from him. Got to talk to him for 15 minutes. He said, tell everybody hello. And I told him, I said, it won't be long, Lord willing, we'll be picking you up and bringing you back to church with us and get you back in. But we find that he's not only a pretender, but he claims to be a man of peace. The third thing, he'll be a man of great position. He'll be given a crown. We'll find that later. He'll go forth, but he's going to be crowned, friend. Power and position. I thought about the other day, the elections coming up. You elect officials to run the nation with your uh, approval on them. But it seems like nowadays when somebody gets into office, they do what they want to. That point in time, they no longer represent the people. You elect them, they get up there, then they get into a group if they're Democrat, they vote with the Democrats for a Republican, they vote with the Republicans. And, and listen, I want them to govern. When we send somebody up there, I want them to govern in a way that we send them up there to govern. That's why they're called representatives. They are to represent the common people. The United States is a government by the people and for the people. It's not by the government and for the government. But we find he's also a man of great position. He'll be a man of great power. He'll go forth conquering and he'll have a purpose, my friend, and that's to conquer this world. Now, what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to just take the prophecies of Antichrist and we're going to go over them Real quick, who is this man called that wicked? That man of sin. The other day in Sunday school, a lot of people don't get here for Sunday school. The back back in classes, uh, I was uh, in chapter number uh, forty nine, where Jacob begins commanding concerning his sons and the latter days, and he dealt with a man by the name of Dan. Now we're going to take a look at this. The first mention of Antichrist. Now, it doesn't use that word. There's only one time in the Bible when Antichrist deals with that person. The word Antichrist is used only five times in your Bible. Four times it deals with people that have the spirit of Antichrist. The only one time it deals with them. So Antichrist is not a name that a lot of people are familiar with. If you look in Genesis chapter number 3, he's called the seed of the serpent. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. I thought this interesting. The woman, uh, Adam blamed God. He said, The woman that thou gavest me did it. All right. That, actually, he shifted the blame to God. And then the woman blamed the serpent. She just said, The serpent beguiled me, and the serpent didn't have anybody to blame. So he took it on the chin. But notice what he said. The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. How many women, how many of you love to handle snakes? Other than the obvious, all right? Uh, last, last, was it Wednesday night? The girls brought a snake in here, and I took a picture of about five or six of them passing a snake around, holding a snake. I said, it's women that always are snake handlers. You don't bring, hey, they want to know if Miss Barbara wanted to come up and rub the snake. I said, take it back there to her. <laughs> You'll find out something real quick, all right? This was the actual serpent. But notice the prophetic part. And between thy seed, now that seed is Christ. Between thy seed, that's the devil's seed, and her seed, that's Christ. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise thy heel. So the first mention of Satan incarnate, the seed of Satan is in the same breath with the seed of God. Puts them both in. One's an anti of the other. He's the judge of his people. Genesis chapter 49. This is what I dealt with in Sunday school. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. The word uh, Dan means to judge. 
Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel, so that his rider shall fall backward. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Now, if I read that right, it's going to be Dan or somebody out of the tribe of Dan that's going to judge Israel. You read that again, it said that he's an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heels. The Bible said that Satan's seed would bruise his heel. So we find a prophecy. Now, I'm not going to say exactly tonight that the Antichrist is going to be a Jew, but I believe the Bible points in that way. We're going to run through these uh, these verses I don't know of anybody that the Jews would accept in that position other than a Jew. You know, the Jews stay together. They stick together, and God bless them. I'm all for them. But he's called the judge of his people in Dan. Under number three, he's called the wicked prince of Israel. And that profane, wicked prince of Israel, that tells me he's of Jewish birth whose day is come when iniquity shall have an end. Notice he's talking about the end time when iniquity is eventually going to come to an end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high, and I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is I will give. So we find that he's called the judge of his people. Then in Ezekiel, he's called the wicked prince of Israel. Under number four, he's also called the little horn. Daniel said it this way in chapter 7, verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now in chapter 8, he went on with it. And he said, And out of one of them came forth a little horn that waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. That's speaking of Israel. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now, when you go to the book of Revelation, you're going to find that's something the dragon does with his tail. So he's talking about Satan in the end time. Prophetic. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, I, I put in here an interpretation of what he's saying, and then an application. But interpretation, he was talking about a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. The word Antiochus means the illustrious one. Epiphanes was a name given to him by his peers, and it means a madman or prophetically Christ. Here's a little history on Antiochus Epiphanes. This is the interpretation, and then the prophetical application goes to the book of Revelation. He was a Syrian king, came with peace, but destroyed 80,000 men, women, and children, sold 40,000 into slavery. He was a God-hater and a Jew-hater who sought to destroy It is a matter of historical record as to the desire of Antiochus to destroy the Jewish nation and their religion. When Antiochus set up the image of Jupiter in the holy place in Jerusalem and desecrated the sanctuary, it said that he offered a hog on the altar and its holy vessels, he was unwittingly portraying a future defilement. Daniel refers to this incident as the abomination that maketh desolate in Daniel 11 and 12. 
Jesus linked this uh, event to Matthew 24 when he declared, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. It said by some that he offered that sow. So we find he's talking about the Antichrist. A lot of this has been fulfilled practically, but prophetically he's looking forward to somebody else. Under number five, he's called the king of a fierce countenance. Daniel chapter 8, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Medah and Persia. That was Darius and Cyrus. I put that in parentheses. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. That was Alexander the Great. The great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, there whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance. He uses that, a king of fierce countenance. And understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. Notice that's a capital P. That is a direct uh, reference to Jesus Christ. When you go over to the book of Isaiah, he's called the Prince of Peace. So he's going to stand up against the Prince, the Prince of Peace. Let me go back to this thing. I love these iPads. It shifted gears on me here. Up, 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 up. All right. Now we've got to start back over real quick. Hey, Amen. Let me, let me go down to where we were at. I must have touched a, a, a button someplace or the other. But notice he's going to stand up, and he's going to stand up against the prince, and that prince of princes is Christ, and he shall be broken without hand. Under six, he's called the prince of the people. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, he deals with the 70 weeks prophecy, but he said 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now he's talking about the end time when Christ's kingdom is set up. He said, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that was done under Cyrus, under the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks, and the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, that's the tribulation period, or Jacob's trouble, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the people. And Daniel 11, this is one of the strongest verses of Scripture that deals with him being a Jew. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. That's what Satan did in the beginning in heaven. And shall speak marvelous thing against the God of gods, and shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. I want you to notice that phrase. Antichrist will not regard the God of his fathers. Who's, who is the God of his fathers? That's a capital G. That's Jehovah God. Who are his fathers? That's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He'll turn his back. He has to be a Jew in order to regard the God of his fathers. 
nor the desire of women. He'll be a single man, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and a God whom his fathers knew not. He goes back and deals with these fathers again. These are the fathers of Israel. Shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things? So we find that he is possibly, and I'm going to say probably, going to be of Jewish descent. He'll be born of the people. He'll be the prince of the people. But it talks about the God of his fathers. The last thing that I want to deal with is found over in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We're familiar with this. If you study your Bible, any time that you have a first of two books, it is always doctrinal in nature. 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter, 1 John. You can go all the way through. They're doctrinal in nature, and thank God. When you have a second or third in a book, 2 Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, 2 Peter, 2 Third John, all of these deal with the conditions that set up the end time. They deal with prophecy and the coming of the Lord and the destruction of the wicked. So when you go to Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, we're familiar with this. He said, let no man deceive you by any means. Now he's talking now to the church. He's talking to the church 2,000 years ago. Prophetic, he's talking to us. But the last days started with Christ. The last days have been going on for 2,000 years. You have 7,000 7, years of time or 7 days in God's economy. The Bible said that a day is as 1,000 years, 1,000 years as a day to the Lord. So what God made was 7 days. In the beginning when He created the heavens and the earth, in 6 days He created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is. No gaps no great expanses of time, no theistic evolution, all of that stuff out. Seven literal days. The Bible clarified, said in the evening and the morning was the first day, and the evening and the morning was the second day and on through. The Jewish day started at 6 o'clock in the evening. He's talking about 24-hour periods of time, not great time. We've got a lot of people that like to uh, kind of shake hands and nestle up with the evolutionary crowd. Let me tell you something. We are not on the page with evolution. In the beginning, God, the four most important, probably believe the most, the greatest uh, doctrinal statement ever made was made in those four words. In the beginning, God. Before everything was, God always has been. But we find in here that there's a deception. But now he deals with that day, all right? For that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first. We are in the end of that falling away. I've dealt with that again, folks. Let me tell you something fundamental Bible-believing people are about like hen's teeth. Very few of them out here anymore. Men I went to school with, they've drifted off to the left. You know, sometimes you get one drift off to the right, but I, you don't find a whole lot of that. And by the way, if you get overloaded in one area, if you're not careful, then you'll get off too far to the right. I believe we need to walk in the middle of the Scriptures and rightly divide the Word of Truth. But we live in that day of a falling away, and we're to end, and that man of sin, the son of perdition, a cause him two things. One, the man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, somebody years ago in Bible college, one of the men of the church up at Tabernacle wrote a book where he thought Judas is carrot was probably going to be the Antichrist because in one place it did say he was the son of perdition and he goeth to his own place. I don't believe it's Judas resurrected. I believe Judas has his special place. Boy, God dealt with him. Christ dealt with him at the supper. He said, woe be to that man, friend, that betrayed him. He said, woe unto that man. There's going to be a special place for him. He walked with Christ for three and a half years. He heard him pray. He heard him preach. He saw him resurrect dead and heal and steal storms and feed multitudes. He watched this man that could have only been God. Then he deserted God. But he's called the man of sin. 
If you go over to John 8, 44, we're not going to go there tonight. But the Lord indicted the Pharisees when he said, Ye are of your father the devil. He said he was a liar from the beginning, and he said, You're liars, and you're following right in that. Now, notice he said, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, and or that uh, which is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now you go back to the book of Ezekiel, and you find what Satan did in the beginning. Satan said that I'll, I'll sit on his seat, I'll exalt myself above all that's called God. Satan is not in his former position. A lot of people say he's cast out of heaven. No, we found in the book of Job, he's still there as the accuser of the brethren. You go to Revelation, he's the accuser of the brethren who accuses us night and day before God. But you're going to find war in heaven when we get to think chapter number 12 of Revelation and then we'll find when he's ultimately cast to the earth having great wrath because his time is short. But when we get in here, we find... This Antichrist is going to do just exactly what Satan did in the beginning. You find first mentions in the Bible always agree with last mentions. That means everything is consistent in the mention. And the first mention of a subject or a word, God states his mind on that particular word or subject, and God never changes his mind. That's why we have to go to first mention to find out what was in the mind of God. And when you do that, the last mention will tie up with it. But look in verse 5. Remember ye not that when, when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now that's 2,000 years ago. This was already being set up 2,000 years ago. The Apostle Paul said, writing to Timothy, he said, all the churches in Asia have forsaken me. Apostatized within just a short time after the Apostle Paul established the churches. I think that's in 2 Timothy, maybe 1 Timothy. be very easy. Look up the word Asia. And it'll take you right to the reference. He said they have already... So we're talking about 2,000 years ago. But he said, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let. That, that word let means to hinder. The Spirit of God today is actively keeping Antichrist at bay. That's why I asked God to give us a little reprieve. We got a little reprieve for three years. They've done everything in the world to destroy a president that we duly elected. People say, well, that's political. It's, let me tell you, the church better get political, my friend. This silent majority across this land had better be speaking up, friend, because socialism is... It is on the verge of taking over our nation right now, friend. I call the Democratic Party the Socialist Party of America. That's what they are. They're not capitalists. I'm a capitalist. I, I had a young lady that I, I, I think the world of, and she, she talked about the Republican uh, being uh, the party of the rich. Let me tell you something. They are a capitalist party. And I thank God, I told her, I hope the rich get richer because they're the job creators that put you to work. That's the ones that have put America back on its feet the last three years. Listen, that's what capitalism is. If you work and you own and you build, you get rich. But it feeds everybody else in the process, and that's what puts us to work. Now, notice what he said. He said, and then shall that wicked, if you notice the word wicked is capitalized. That's not a reference to just any man. We've got a lot of wicked people in this world. This world's a wicked world. It's dangerous on our streets tonight. I remember when Barbara was a child, we were all raised up in a little coal mining camp in western Kentucky, and we'd play out, we'd play spotlight tag, and we'd 
catch lightning bugs and we'd run around in the dark up and down the streets and around town. We, we went everywhere. We'd go trick-or-treating all over the town. Just nobody, nobody ever bothered you. You know, just little kids were kids and they could grow up. Women were not disrespected. We live in a different day today. We live in a day where a lot of people's hearts are desperately wicked. They'll hurt you out here. But this says that wicked, capital W, be revealed. He's talking about Antichrist. He's talking about the seed of that servant. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, I want you to notice what he's doing today. Verse 9 said, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And he is deceiving this world today, and they are following him just like uh, the children followed Pan out of the city when he played on the flute. They're following Satan today. That thing did this again. You hang on, amen. I love this thing. After the service, I may give it to you. But notice what he said in verse 10. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. How are they being deceived today? Through unrighteousness. It did it again. Devil don't want this thing to go out here tonight. But we're going to go right back. I know where it is. That's right at the end. Amen. I'm going to leave it alone. In them that perish. Now notice what he said. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. We find a general forsaking today of Jesus Christ. I said this morning that I was going to, I'm on a, a Facebook group with a bunch of military guys I was in with 50 years ago. And uh, uh, so today I just put my testimony of salvation. I told them, I was just like, that's all they want to talk about. They was in overseas, they drank and ran with women, they did everything in the world over there. Uh, thank God I didn't do that part of it. I was not saved. I, I was in a lot of the stuff with them, but I was faithful to Barbara, just I minded my own business, amen. But this afternoon, I said, I want to give a word of testimony, and I wrote a long paragraph to these people over there. Men I'd been in the military with, I've got nothing but likes. You know how Facebook is, you know, you like it or you don't like it or you whatever, you know. Yeah, y'all, y'all better at that than I am. But I, I thought it, you know, they were talking about all the fun they had when they were overseas. And I thought to myself, they need to be witnessed to. And I just told them what Jesus Christ can do. How he saved my soul at age 28. Boy, I gave my heart to Christ on a Sunday night. Then 44 years ago, this coming November, right? next month is my birthday month. Amen. But I thank the Lord for that. You know, most people today reject. I've been waiting for somebody to say, you need to keep that religious stuff off of here. But I'm going to tell them, you need to keep your booze and your sin off of here. This was about the military, not about what you did after hours. It has nothing to do with that, amen. And I will tell them, I'll tell them, you need Christ a whole lot more than you need what you had when we were over there. But the wicked, that wicked... His influence is working in our day to bring to pass a setting up. I don't know who Antichrist is, but I will almost promise you if he was born of a woman, he's a grown man right now somewhere. One of these days we'll be called up out of here. The church will be raptured out. We'll go to heaven and he's going to be revealed. Now, I'm going to deal with him one more night. Lord willing, this next Sunday night. There's something I, I want to deal with that won't take too long, and then we're going to go on in. But the first seal, the first part of the judgment of God on this world is God is going to give them what they want. I've often said, I'm excited to see what happens in November because I want to see where the heart of America is. We're going to find out where the heart of America is in December. We're going to find out the will of the people. And that's what the setting up is. This is who they're looking for, but I'm going to quote that preacher again, and I'm going to quit tonight. God will always give you what you want, but it will always cost you what you've got. 
God's going to give the world what they want, but it is going to cost them what they've got. Amen. Let's stand tonight and we're going to have an invitation. Just wanted to go over these verses with you. I didn't know of any other way to preach them than to read them. I think the Bible is pretty clear upon who this is.